Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I had a lot of people explain to me it's really hard to get out here to Idaho. I turn around and explain that's what I do every single time I go anywhere. So I feel no sympathy for you. But I'm really glad you're here. So thank you. I really appreciate it. I had several people ask me yesterday, so, um, so where did MZ come from anyway? Uh, and so instead of telling the story over and over again, you're all going to get it here. If you've already heard the story, I'm sorry. Um, it might still be interesting to you. Um, I think it is. So um, I thought I'd give a little background. So these two economists, Hank and Shell, uh, Dr. Hank Robeson and Dr. Shell Christofferson had this little economics firm in Idaho. I moved up to Idaho from the Bay Area because I was tired of traffic and uh, expensive houses and all the things that come along with that. So moved up there, turned around, hey, guess what? There's no real good jobs here. So somebody has to make jobs, so why not me? So uh, I was lucky enough to work with these two guys. They were in a town where it's a college town. There's either the hospital or the university or Walmart were kind of the employment opportunities. Um, and kind of the early revelation that we had is, well, think about it this way. When you meet someone new, and you've probably heard me say this before, when you meet someone new, you always ask, what do you do, right? And you're asking what their job is, but it betrays that there's something more to a job um, a job helps define you in a really interesting way. It defines how you can interact with your community, um, how much time you get to spend with your family, can you go on vacations, what kind of vacations you go on. And so a job defines a person in a really interesting way. And I've always had this passion around prosperity. How do we drive prosperity for individuals? And how do we make sure that they have not only a career that they love, but a career that pays well um, and allows them to um, interact in their community in that way? Um, and part of that is one of my great loves in life is eating. And I thought if we could have high wage jobs in Moscow, then those people will go to restaurants and then we'll have more restaurants. And it's working. We have awesome restaurants in Moscow. So anyway, I'd rec recommend coming down for a, a meal sometime. So anyway, so this is kind of our vision, right? So the three of us started doing economic impact studies for community colleges. The reason we started with community colleges is back to this passion around how do we drive prosperity for individuals. Community colleges serve a really uh, interesting demographic of folks who really need a lot of help um, often, and they can really help them get on a completely different career path and kind of career trajectory, right? And so connected to that, we thought, well, let's help these community colleges speak the language of business, help them understand what their impact is in their community. Start talking to presidents of community colleges. They're like, I love that we have a rate of return of 5% for our taxpayers. How do we make it 6%? Oh, no problem. You need to train people for high-wage, high-demand jobs, right? Makes sense. Because if they earn more money, they're going to be um, more likely to spend money on taxes and be out in the community. Like, oh, great. So where do we find these high-wage, high-demand jobs, right? This is 20 years ago as we're starting this process. And they're like, well, labor market data, of course. They're like, okay, well, what's that? And, uh, and how do you get it? So, oh, we could do that. So. Um, that's why we're in a labor market. It's uh, not some grand scheme. We wanted to drive prosperity. We wanted to serve our customers, and um, they needed labor market data, so we started with that. So obviously, as we fast forward, uh, we get to 2008, and the economy starts getting really rough. It's hard for people to find a job, and you have these unemployment offices with lines out the door. And so we had customers in the workforce investment boards, um, as well as economic development, said, hey, is there any way that you could take some of this labor market data and make it digestible for people? like for students, someone who really wants to interact on where should they be in the labor market? Do they have a career vision? How do they get a career vision? So that's where Career Coach came from. So um, all of the products that you see that we create are because you, our customers, said, hey, we've got a problem. Is there any way you can solve it? Right? So fast forward, as we're starting to create these jobs, I said, man, we need a vision. for uh, We need a goal uh, for what are we going to do with MZ here in Moscow? So our original goal, our original business goal at MZ was 50 people earning over $50,000 a year in Moscow, right? Not a traditional business goal, but we thought if you can have that many people earning that level of money, you're going to start to actually move the needle on the economy, right? They're going to be out there. They're going to be buying houses and cars. You're going to get this ripple effect. And so that was our goal. Um, the, it's a great goal. The problem is you can actually go out of business executing on that goal. Right? So, and we actually got to that point. I remember there was a day when we had $100,000 in payroll and $10,000 in the bank. I'm like, I would love to avoid this in the future. So, 
uh, we were, we were, everything worked out fine, um, and, and here we are today. So um, we've been very blessed, but that has been our roots. It's all been around how do we drive prosperity, how do we bless individuals. Then we came to this moment of like, okay, we've gotten past 50, how do we get to a million? And I realized, well, I'm probably never going to hire a million people because I don't want to do Walmart. I'm just not gifted in that way. Um, and so how do we get to a million people? And the only way that we get to a million people that are truly blessed, that have data at the point of decisions, that are in a career that is satisfying to them, that they can provide for their family, that they can be meaningful society, is through our customers, right? Um, whether you're a workforce investment board or a college or a university or a huge business that, you know, United Health Group that has hundreds of thousands of employees, as we heard a couple years ago, um, if we can provide great data for you, if we can come alongside and really help you, then you have that reach, right? That's where we get to a million people and well past a million people. So we are very grateful because honestly, we're in this together. If we want to drive prosperity in America and now the world in a lot of ways, um, the only way we're going to do that is we're working together. Um, so we're really grateful because if we create all this data and you don't do anything with it, it's useless, right? Even if we stay in business, it doesn't matter because we want this data to be used in the lives of individuals so that they can go out and do um, great things and have a better life, okay? Does that make sense? So anyway, so that's the background of Emsi. These are the two economists. Um, they're largely retired, although they come into the often, office often. They ride their bikes on the, on the trail. It's beautiful. So that's just a little bit of background on Emsi and, and why we're there. We got past that 50 employees at $50,000, right? Um, we've been super blessed. Um, we're over 200 employees now. We have an office in London, in Moscow, and in Dallas, I like to say. Um, and it's not the Moscow you think. <laughs> but, um, but we've had the, just the opportunity to, to bless lots and lots of customers. A little over a year ago, we were lucky enough to join the Strata Education Network. And honestly, they have been just a phenomenal partner. Not only are they mission aligned, Right? So we're trying to drive prosperity. They're trying to get students to be informed consumers of education, to complete with a purpose, like actually get through education the right way. And so we had, like, it feels like we fell into a chocolate pie. And man, do I love chocolate pie. So uh, they are just a wonderful partner. They also have a national reach. Uh, they have thought leadership nationally. And so we've been able to partner with them, be a data partner for them. They've been just a wonderful organization to work with. So a um, uh, big shout out to Strata. Um, and they've just been a great partner for us. So, but we got past this 50 employees at $50,000. Okay, then what do we want to do? And so we really needed to take some time. Um, and Rob talked about these circles a little bit yesterday, so I won't belabor the point. But basically, there's this concept of every individual has a whole bunch of things that they would love to do, right? I always wanted to play professional baseball, but it turns out you have to have a bunch of skills to do that, otherwise people don't pay you to do it, right? Because I can go out and play baseball now and no one will pay for it, it's not very entertaining. So that's one of the things I would have liked to do, but the reality is I just didn't have the skill set, right? And, and I'm short. So, um, so I took that information and like, okay, but how can I take the things that I enjoy and find out where they overlap with the things that people will pay me to do, right? So. That's in the circle between people and employment. That's that kind of section in the middle, which is great. But often the bridge between where people are and what peop where they need to be for people to pay them to do stuff is education, right? It's higher education for you to get the right education to connect those dots, right? And so we believe, or we hope, that with big data and all this billions of data points we're creating, the whole point of it is to find that center point for every individual. And it's different for every individual, right? It's different for who they are. It's different for what employers are looking for. It's different for the skills that they're uh, looking for and the skills that they can get in higher education. So our mission at this point um, is not 50 over 50, but it's to um, help people using labor market data, because that's what we're good at, to connect those people, employers, and education, right? So that's kind of the heart of what MZ's doing, what we get excited about, why we wake up in the morning, because if we can help connect those dots for you, you can go out and, uh, and really help the millions of people that you interact with, uh, then we're happy. Okay, so one of the things we also do at this conference is this is kind of like our report card. Like, what have you done the last year anyway? Um, and, and you are like our board or our boss because we're not doing any of this if we're not blessing you, right? There's no reason for the work we do unless it's really meaningful and you're able to take away something great from it. So this is our report card of here's what we've done 
for the last year. But before we get into that, I'm asked often, as we're working with companies, why is it so hard to find talent? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, the population in the last five years in America grew by 11.8 million. The number of new jobs grew by 12.8 million. And you don't have to be a mathematician to realize that that's a problem, potentially, and why employment rate has gone really lower, right? And so either you need to bring people in or you need to get people off the sidelines so that they start to interact with the labor market, right? That's kind of the spot that we're in at this point. And the thing is, if you look at the future, we see the population growth um, slowing a little bit, but the job market does not appear to be slowing down at this point, right? So what's that's gonna create? This is the um, historically low unemployment, tight wages, um, and I hope it'll actually continue to drive wages up for individuals um, in kind of a market sense, uh, because it is a very tight labor market. So, but the other thing that's really interesting is, okay, so it's a people problem. Do we have enough people? If you look at the civilian labor force participation rate, and this is one of the few conferences in the world where you can throw up a slide like this and people are like, ooh. <laughs> Labor force participation rate over the last 20 years. This is straight out of the uh, Department of Labor. Well, you can see those, uh, you know, the, the, the dot com and then the real estate bubbles kind of popping, and there are more people on the sidelines, and they've kind of stayed there, right? So you got, you know, they were showing 67% participation, and part of that is um, do people stay in the uh, workforce longer? Do people enter the workforce sooner? Um, do, um, do, uh, do the parent that's staying home with the kid, are they involved in the workforce, right? These are all the factors that are gonna drive labor force participation, but it's actually stayed fairly stubbornly low, and honestly, I don't see it coming up unless wages significantly come up, right? You need to have someone be able to earn enough money to decide, okay, fine, I'll stop playing golf, I'll get back to work, right? Um, that's either that or they just, maybe they need to run out of money. But here's the other thing that I think is um, maybe a little more scary is if you look at the labor force participation rate in the 16 to 19 year olds, 20 years ago it was almost 50% of that demographic was in the labor force at some level. Now, part of this is people might be um, working at home or they might be working in, if you're mow lawns, this is only people who are actually like working for McDonald's or whatever, right? If they're mowing lawns, it's probably not showing up there anyway. But it has also stayed fairly persistently low, so we're at about 34% of that demographic is in the workforce today. Well, what's the top thing that employers ask for? They want soft skills, right? Well, how do you get soft skills? Well, probably that part-time job at McDonald's, right? Because that's where you learn that, you know, you actually have to talk to your boss and look them in the eye and show up on time and, you know, wear clothes, the things, <laughs> the things that are associated with, you know, that kind of job. So, um, so... I, I, would, I would argue that we're going we're gonna to continue to see this until we can get people more in the labor market. It's going to continue to be, and obviously economies always fluctuate. They go up and down. Uh, I, policy has a huge impact on this, uh, but also I think just economies go up and down because they get tired of being hot, and so they get cold, and then excited, right? So, but I do think that this is part of the reason that we have a fairly tight labor market. We have uh, a lot of people on the sidelines um, who are um, not working. Um, and we're going to need to see more of those people working. So how do we solve this problem, right? How do we solve this problem? Well, um, this is, uh, Rob talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, I think we need to give people more of a career vision, right? Not just, hey, go get a job because you need to earn money. Um, obviously, that's a talk track that's not working because we see that labor force participation rate kind of staying stubbornly low. So we need to give people a career vision of something that they know they're doing something really meaningful, that it fits with who they are and they're able to go out and make a great living and understand it. I was explaining to someone uh, recently, you think about corporate learning and development systems, right? Do so you look at that learning and development system and it says, hey, would you like to learn Excel? Well, no, not really. How about negotiation? Like there's a broad category. Do you want to learn negotiation? Well, not really. I'd rather, you know, go watch TV. Um, and so if you have, and, and some people like I actually, I like to learn like Python on the side because I think programming's funny and great, and I used to do it. But most people look at that kind of learning and development opportunities like, do I really want to learn those things? Not really, right? But if the conversation's different, if you say, hey, where you are today, if you have these 
three additional skills, the market will pay you about $5,000 a year more. Oh, suddenly that Excel class is a little more interesting, right? If you have a reason for what you're trying to accomplish, right? And so I think, I mean, our solution is obviously to provide data to you all, uh, but the more people that are using this information to build career visions for people, to help them understand where they are with their career and with their life, the more that that is accomplished, the more I think the economy is going to prosper. And that's really at the heart of what we want to accomplish. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about skills today. And as this common language between these three categories of, of folks, and increasingly uh, job titles are simply not detailed enough, or a four-year degree block is not necessarily detailed enough, like computer science. Well, there's so many things you learn in a computer science degree, right? Is it focused on mobile development, database design? Like, what, what is it, right? And so increasingly, job titles or SOC codes or CIP codes are simply not detailed enough for the complexity and the interaction that's happening in the labor market. Right? And so we're going to talk about these skills because we need to be able to understand the skill gaps of an individual and inject the skills necessary to get there. So we're going to talk about that a lot today. And this is, we believe the skills are kind of the language that allows us to disaggregate those large categories of degree and work, resumes, job postings, et cetera, down to the details so you can understand how do people match up and how do they get that career vision so they can get off the sidelines and get to work. Right? Make sense? Cool. All right. So let me run through some product updates. These are things we've done in the last year. Remember, this is our report card. You can take notes um, and, and send me notes and say, you guys didn't do a good job this year, and I will do a better job next year, I promise. A uh, couple updates um, on, from the higher ed team. So we kind of break into three different teams at MZ, focused on higher ed, community insights, um, and then talent. So just making sure that we have product people who are waking up every day thinking about your problems and how to solve them, right? And speaking of which, back to what Rob said, those, those booths out there, the little round tables, they're not just a spot to put your drink, although you can put your drink there. They'll take care of it for you. Um, those are actually product people. So those, um, you know, some people are like, oh, man, booths. That's where the salespeople hang out. I'm not going to make eye contact, right? No, those are the people who are actually directing the engineers to build products for you. So that's, if you have a problem with a product or if you have an idea with a product, those are the people because they're the ones who are actually um, every day um, doing the blocking and tackling that make great products for you. So I would encourage you to um, grab them. Since I'm on the subject, if you see people with an MZ tag, we're green, it's a different color, um, and if you have any question for them or you want anything, if you want your shoes shined, you grab a, an MZ person, they will do it for you or they won't be here next year. Is that clear? <laughs> Uh, but for lunch today, grab an MZ person if you want lunch. They might buy it for you. Um, so I would encourage you, find, find MZ people, ask them questions. We really want to serve you um, with everything we've got. So, okay. So one of the things we were able to accomplish this year is save reports. So uh, if you've used analysts before, this is, I hope, exciting, where uh, our data is updating constantly. And so we thought, well, how do you handle that uh, transition? But the reality is that um, now you have the ability, if you use analysts once a month or once a year or once a quarter, you can save a report with all the stuff that you've done last time and you can just come back in and it will have all the new datas and you can just hit print and it's magical and you can share those reports with other people in your organization. So if you want to create a report and then not have to hit print and take it to someone's desk, you can actually share it with people and they can see what's going on in the economy. So, um, this is really cool. It doesn't sound that hard because we've been saving Word documents for years, but it is harder than it sounds. Anyway, we're very excited about it. Next one. For those of you who don't know, we launched another product this year called Go Recruit. And here's, let me, let me frame the problem a little bit. So if you're a college recruiter and you have a student come to you and they're like, oh, this is a really cool computer science program. Can you tell me where do the graduates go from this computer science program? And you're like, well, I have one story and I'm going to use that story. The problem is if the other recruiter already used that story, you're in real trouble, right? Um, and so Ashley Safransky, who is, Ashley's right there. Um, Ashley was a college recruiter at Washington State University, and she was tired of using only one story, so she came to MZ and fixed the problem. No problem, right? <laughs> so uh, what Go Recruit does is we basically take all the great alumni data from um, from your alumni. Where are they in the workforce? What companies are they working for? How much are they probably earning? 
and we make it so that you can turn that into infographics for a Twitter campaign or an email campaign, or you can have an iPad while you're walking around with the family doing a tour, because there are two people that you're recruiting in college generally, the student and the parent, right? And they have very different questions. The students may be student life, how many concerts, all that stuff. Parents are like, when will they get out of my basement? <laughs> right? And so that's what Go Recruit helps them answer, is where do students actually go from this program? Um, where has success been, and what percentage of them um, are out there? Um, so that's Go Recruit, and we have a bunch of colleges using it. Uh, we have a partnership with Ruffalo No Levitz, who is um, bringing it to their customers, so we're excited about Go Recruit. If you have questions for it, Ashley again, or any of those booths out there, you can go ahead and ask someone. You can give critiques or ideas or insights, and we'd love to have them. Next, this is a really cool one as well. So one of the things we've been trying to do is if you take an adult learner, someone who is um, maybe been in the workforce for a while, uh, maybe has a couple kids at home, maybe they're a single parent, um, and they want to try and get the right education so they can have a more prosperous life. Well, that person generally can't sign up for a four-year degree, right? They just can't. It's really hard. And so what we've done is we've said, look, we've got these 30,000 skills, and the brilliant Justina and team have been figuring out how skills interact with each other. So side note on skills. Skills are things in resumes and job postings, right? And we have hundreds of millions of resumes and job postings. The problem is they're never defined, right? If you see accounting or Python in a resume, what does that mean? At what level, right? So the only way to really define skills that we found is to uh, understand where they're, what they're next to. What are they adjacent to? What are they clustered with? How do we see them clustering together? And that's the way that you define it. If you see Python on a resume, and they're applying for a computer science program, or a computer science job, but there's no other technical skills there, my guess is they're a total newbie novice, right? And so that's what we're going to start to gonna tease out with this machine learning model, because if Python is next to SQL and Java and C++, I bet they're pretty good at Python, right? So the only way to define skills is the adjacency it has to other skills, right? And so once you have that information, we can say, ah, if you're an adult learner, what's a job you've done before? Ah, you're, you've been a barista at Starbucks. Awesome. Here's all the skills that baristas at Starbucks generally have. Which one of these do you have? Confirm or deny, right? And they start going through this and interacting with it. Like, okay, great. What's another job you had? Well, I was a, I was a painter. I painted houses. Awesome. Okay, here's the skills that generally those folks have. Pick the ones that you have, right? Okay, well, now we've got this interesting skills inventory for a person that allows us to say, all right, so here's a skills match for different careers for you, and all you need to do is fill in these specific things. I was talking to a student in California, and it was, uh, you know, when we're in the guts of this data, like, well, it's great, uh, it's cool, but when we're in the guts of this data, we don't realize um, how meaningful it is for a lot of these individuals to have this information. She was almost tearing up. She's like, so you're telling me that my job as a barista and as a painter, those skills actually are going to have an impact on the rest of my career and my life. But yeah, because you learn stuff, right? You learn how to interact with people, et cetera. She's like, that's amazing. I thought they were throwaway jobs. And then suddenly we've got what we need. So skills match, uh, it's in beta. We've got a couple of colleges using it today, universities using it today. If you want to know more about it, Lendl, are you here? Lendl is over there. So Lendl's the guy. Talk to him. Um, he is the product manager for this, and we'd love to talk to you. Now, the next question, the next problem we ran into is, um, okay, well, that's great. If we can uh, disaggregate an individual to the skills they have, how do you disaggregate the programs that our college has to the skills that, um, that are being taught? Um, and so we have a clever name come up by Bob Hieronymus, Skillabi. So how can we tag all of the skills in your syllabi? Get it? Ah. Uh, so, um, so this is also uh, something we can help you with, um, and we'll get into that more. Okay, um, on our community insights team, and again, part of the reason we're talking about all these different products is because even though you might not be in community insights or higher ed, these are cool things we're doing, and you guys are the best inventors of how to use some of this data to solve problems in your world, right? So that's why you're getting the, the full rundown on all the new things. Business Engage. Business Engage was a concept of how do we identify which businesses are at risk or are strong in our region so that we can uh, identify who might be a flight risk, that they're going to leave the region, 
um, who might be an opportunity for us to engage with, right? So business engage, we take all kinds of the massive amounts of labor market data and job postings and profiles, community insight data, and we take all that together and we start to give you an indicator of which businesses are in really great shape and which businesses might be looking to leave or are starting to not be as strong so you can come alongside and make sure that they're in good shape. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Business Engage, Sheridan, Sheridan right there, uh, feel free to grab him and he can um, take you through this. He can talk about the methodology of how we got there um, and get your ideas. More on Business Engage here. Again, prioritize, monitor, and then support. A big data set that we came out with this year, which we're excited about, is historic wages. Uh, the trick with historic wages is the OES um, jumps up and down and says, don't do historic wages with this data set um, because of the way that the survey works. Um, but uh, we figured out a way that we are very comfortable with uh, to get to historic wages. If you're on the data team, so Justin, is Justin here? Justin, right there. Justin's right there, or one of his people. If you want to ask how we got to historic wages, he's the man to talk to, uh, I think. Sure. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Connected back to the skills. So we talked about, like, we need to be able to identify the skills that an individual has. Well, what about the skills that a region have, right? What if we got to a point of understanding um, what's the regional makeup of skills? What are our strengths, not just at an industry level, but what are our strengths at a skill level, right? Does Indianapolis have the skills necessary to attract a successful biotech firm? Well, that's an interesting question. Or what are the skill gaps that a region has that we can come alongside with the higher education folks to actually fill regional skill gaps and do the right training so that the economy is stronger, right? So if we can understand the economy at the skills level, we can start to do this. So um, this is also something you can talk to Sheridan or Josh um, or really anybody with a green tag and we'll be happy to talk about. Next, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to keep cranking here, uh, community indicator data. So we got the ACS data, uh, which was difficult to wrangle, but we wrangled it um, and we uh, normalized it and made sure it was all happy and then we wedged it into our tools. So if you want to know about remote workers or housing vacancies or foreign born population um, or uh, mean commute times, um, we now have that data in the tool, and we did it because people wanted it, so um, we did it. So if you want other data, just tell us, and we'll probably do it. Talent updates. I've just got a couple here. Um, we created, uh, we've been working with more and more staffing firms, and so we've created specific products to make sure that we help them understand. Um, we have this cool input-output model. Um, it, it looks at the, the inflow and outflow of goods and labor in an economy. It's really interesting, but what it does is it can tell us how much is being spent on staffing in an economy um, and, um, and in what areas, um, in addition to a bunch of other stuff. So we created a bunch of staffing reports. If you're interested in the I.O. model, input, output, and you want to totally nerd out, uh, I talked to a number of people who did. Um, Jonathan, my brother, younger brother, really nice guy anyway, is uh, the guy to talk to. So he's happy to, uh, to explain to you how make and use tables go through matrix algebra and come out with a economic ripple effect. It's magical. Global data. This is a huge undertaking that we've been pushing on over the last year. If you remember last year at the conference, we said, hey, we're launching global data. It's amazing. Um, and I think we had like two or three countries. I don't know. But it was like, hey, we've got it. It's, uh, so we now have 30 countries of data, over 30 countries of data, 33. Five, yes, 35 countries of data, and, and growing every day. Um, the other big thing we've launched is we now have demand data. So we've had kind of the supply of data, so if you, or supply of labor. So if you want to know um, how many computer programmers are in Manila, yes, then you can actually do that, right? Well, we're actually now introducing, we've only got the US, Canada, and the UK right now, but we will have more countries, so you can actually see what employers are looking for and what the demand side of it is, not just the supply side. Um, this is now being used by bunches and bunches of people, um, and actually all over the world. So if you have any questions about global, John Pernsteiner, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, you can call him Pern. Uh, he is uh, leading the global uh, project and has a whole team of wonderful people who are, are knocking this out. So if you have any questions on global, or what data we have or what data we could have, John is the guy to talk to. Last but not least, open skills. So this is kind of 
this is our big announcement. Uh, one of the things that we've realized is being um, in, uh, as part of the Strata network is there's a lot of people who want to understand this interaction between people, education, and work. And we believe that the language, the only way to actually disaggregate that is to do it at the skills level. Well, so we have a library of 30,000 skills that we have painstakingly pulled from resumes and job postings, and it's really hard to create this database. It's kind of boring once you have it, like, oh, 30,000 skills, it's great. But actually pulling that out using natural language processing and other out of uh, resumes and job postings is actually super hard, right? And, but once you have it, you've got some really valuable ways. It's, can think of it as a language, right? So if you have a, a syllabus, for higher education, if you have Python as a skill in there, you want to know that it's the same Python that is being asked for by an employer or that is on a resume. And so we are open sourcing our skills data. So um, we are making it so that anybody in the world is welcome to use all 30,000 skills with their unique ID, um, and they can tag Again, syllabi or resumes or job postings. And the more employers use this, the more higher education uses this, the more um, job seekers use this in their resumes, the more you'll have a common language so you can actually just translate between those things, right? You think of a company like Starbucks who has 50 or 5 million resumes a year that they have to go through. Um, there needs to be better technology to be able to identify skills that people have. So we are open sourcing this. Anybody is welcome to use it. Um, and we have a site specifically for it. There's even examples in here where you can actually drop in a resume or a job posting. It'll tag all the skills. It'll tell you what those skills mean. It'll, it'll look up the current definition of that skill on Wikipedia. Um, and we're making this free to everybody in the world. Um, so I would encourage you to um, do cool things with it because um, it's free and available. It's updated every two weeks. So as new skills emerge in the economy, we're doing all the hard work of making sure those are surfaced, uh, putting them in the database, and then you just get to have it because you're a nice person. It's kind of nice. Um, so uh, this Open Skills Project, um, there will be uh, more information on it, but this is, this is a big announcement. And we actually have a number of partners, including the White House, um, who are using this information already. Um, and we have all of our products are built off of skills data, but now you can build anything you want off it. You can integrate into your systems. Uh, it'll be super awesome. Okay? So, there you go. So, to recap, we're in this together, right? And that's part of the reason we're doing things like open sourcing on the skills, because we can't really move the needle on all those employees. We can't get people off the sidelines and into the labor market unless we're engaging them with just a really meaningful career vision. So uh, we need your help on that. We're going to keep innovating and pushing and growing and doing what we can to serve you. Um, but use this time that we're here together to give us input or ideas um, or push us and say you're not doing enough or you're doing too much or whatever, and we will happily take your input. We really do value your time here. So thank you very much.